Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Ladaris Cordell, retired California Superior Court judge, member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and your moderator for today. The Commonwealth Club has, of course, shifted from in-person programs to virtual events, and we are grateful for the support of our viewers. We appreciate your support of the club by visiting our website at commonwealthclub.org. We also want to remind you to submit questions for our guest via the chat room next to your screen, and I'll get to as many as possible later in the program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Congresswoman Jackie Speer, who represents California's 14th district. The horrifying attack on the US Capitol has raised many issues about American democracy and the state of the country. People are feeling stunned, scared, and angry. What do we make of the attack and what it represents? How damaged is American democracy and what needs to be fixed? What will America look like after January 20th? And can the divisions in the country be mitigated? We're pleased to have Representative Speer with us to delve into these questions at this crucial point in history. She has served in Congress since 2008 and was present during the attack on the Capitol. Representative Speer serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. She is also co-chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus. Welcome, Congresswoman Speer. It's a privilege to be with you. Thank you, LaDoris. Um, you Thank know, I have the utmost respect for you, and I'm really delighted that we're doing this together. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you are one of my heroes. So my, my first question to you is, how are you doing? In 1978, you were pinned down on a tarmac. You were shot five times when fleeing an attack by a gunman in Jonestown. And 43 years later, Wednesday, January 6th, you're pinned down at our nation's capital during an armed insurrection. I mean, was it deja vu all over again for you? How are you? Know, you? In many respects, it was. I was uh, seated in the gallery and, you know, chose to hear the opening uh, remarks and debate on uh, the Arizona vote and whether or not it would be um, accepted, whether or not the re resolution to overturn it would be accepted. And as we were sitting there, all of a sudden, I saw the speaker exit the chamber. And, you know, not that she hasn't done that many times before, but there was an urgency to her walking out. And then shortly thereafter, the majority whip, Steny Hoyer, was escorted out. And then I knew that something was up. Shortly thereafter, one of the sergeants of the Capitol Police stood at the podium and said, the Capitol has been breached. And you know, I, even when I say that now, there's kind of shivers that run down my spine uh, because it was, it, it's such a, um, it, it is such a desecration of the symbol of democracy in our country. And as we sat there, uh, he said, there's a pouch underneath your chair. Now, I've sat in the gallery many times. I never knew that there were canvas pouches under the chairs, but there was. We were told to unzip them. Um, there was then an aluminum foil type um, packet inside. You had to tear that open. And there was the gas mask. And as soon as you pulled it out, it started operating. Um, we were told to not put it on, wait. Um, there was pounding on the doors. They locked all of the doors to the gallery. And then they asked us to start moving. And there is, you know, brass railings on each of the galleries. So it, it's intended so that you can't move from one to the other. So we were bending down, kind of uh, crouched, trying to get through. And then, uh, we finally got to the other side and it seemed like the most secure place to be was up against that wall. So if they entered and were shooting, um, you know, they would have to turn around to uh, get to us. And as we were over in that corner, 
um, the pounding and the breaking of um, the glass kind of, you know, shocked us all. They told us to get down. So um, I laid down on the, that cold marble and then there was a shot that rang out. And when that shot rang out, it really took me back in time. And I laid my cheek on this cold marble. I'll never forget that. And there was a, almost a sense of resignation that overcame me because I was crouched down, not on the first level where there was a, a wall of sorts, but on the second level where the only thing between me and a gunman was a, the back of a chair, so some fabric and some wood. And I realized that, you know, um, this could, in fact, be the end. So it was traumatizing for all of us, frankly, that were in that gallery. Since then, we've created a, um, a group of us called the Gallery Group, where we um, talk to each other. And we actually um, had a conversation with a healthcare professional on Sunday who, you know, helped us uh, observe what um, we should in terms of, um, you know, the self-care necessary to, to overcome something as traumatic as that and the PTSD associated with it. Um, you know, we all process that kind of an experience differently. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I remember getting on the plane the next morning very early um, and the plane was packed and it was packed with all of these Trump supporters, all of these members of that rally. And I sort of, you know, sat meekly um, in my chair, uh, kind of couched uh, on the window side. So I got off that plane in Chicago, my, my thighs were aching. And I thought to myself, how did, did I sit improperly? And they ached all through the day. And then I realized when I talked to some of my colleagues who were there as well, you know, there was that adrenaline rush that happens. We were, you know, crouched down. We were moving through these various galleries. So our muscles were, you know, activated. And, you know, it took a couple of doses of ibuprofen to re relieve that. But it was all part of the experience. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, there is video of at least one police officer taking a selfie with the mob and another of officers removing barriers to allow the mob to freely enter the capital. So, you know, history is important. In Nazi Germany, uh, a private security detail cleared the halls of Hitler's opponents during his rallies, and those security forces became the Nazi stormtroopers. The, there's a very strong implications that there are mob sympathizers, right-wing extremists embedded in the Capitol Police Department. Uh, and this certainly doesn't bode well for the inauguration. In a letter dated January 8th to Speaker Pelosi, you have called for the creation of an independent commission to investigate the security failures at the U.S. Capitol. And I, I read your letter and it listed 18 areas of inquiry. And can you tell us maybe what are some of those areas that you want looked into? And, and what is your take on the failure of security to protect the Capitol? Well, it's a, it's a very serious question. I think all of us um, have spent a, a fair amount of time uh, conversing among ourselves about the lack of security. You know, there was a decision made not to use lethal force. Um, so uh, you saw officers, you know, being bludgeoned, uh, one with a fire extinguisher who um, ultimately died because of it. So, you know, murder took place on, uh, in the Capitol. Uh, so there, there is a, uh, a need, I believe, to do an independent review of experts to look at what uh, did take place. Now, as chair of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, I had a hearing last year on violent extremism that has infiltrated the military. Um, they not only uh, recruit them, they also recruit veterans who have served because they want the talent of those who have been trained in military um, activity, use of guns, use of various techniques, uh, and uh, plans to uh, actually 
uh, conduct missions. So um, I am I'm deeply concerned about potential infiltration. I'm concerned about uh, the lack of sophistication in assessing uh, what was going to take place. You know, there was a a um, person, uh, actually a lawyer out of Florida, who uh, tweeted the day after. You know, I he says I knew 17 days before the event what was taking place. If you went on Parlor just kind of casually, you would see that it was not just a march that was contemplated, uh, that they intended to do damage, that they there was vengeance in their hearts, that they wanted to overthrow the election and actually our government. So who was it who said no lethal weapons, you, you're not to be armed? Do you know who gave that order? I believe it was the Sergeant of Arms who has now uh, resigned. Uh, I think there was this sense that there, there was not an interest in wanting to create an environment much like existed when uh, they were uh, marching last year and tear gas was used on peaceful protesters. These were not peaceful protesters as we saw. I mean, they defaced the House of Representatives. They broke glass. They stormed in. They went into the Speaker's office uh, and, and damaged uh, parts of her office and broke down doors and um, sat at her desk and took a laptop and also correspondence. So, you know, this was not a peaceful protest. Now, many have also suggested, you know, because this was a group of white people, were they treated differently um, because they were white? I think that's a question that has to be answered. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who have been asking that question, and particularly those who've been involved in protests for Black Lives Matter. Um, so, I mean, I, in my gut says, yeah, there is a difference and there was a double standard. But uh, as you said, you have a commission and let's let's hope they get into it. Do you know who is going to be on that commission and how that's going to be put together? Well, I don't know if, if the speaker has agreed to it. She has texted me that um, it, it's something that she wants to explore further. Uh, I actually right. think be two commissions. I've written a letter on security asking for an independent commission. I think we have to do an independent commission on the domestic terrorism that took place and the groups associated with them. Uh, this is the yeah. beginning of an effort by these people to do harm to our country. Right. This is their watershed moment that they right. seated in um, undertaking. So let, let's pick up on that a little bit more. So I looked up domestic terrorism as defined by federal law. And just, it, it's a long section, but let me just read you a part of it is that uh, it's activities that involve um, acts. Uh, let me, the, the one section I want to get to, if they appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. So that's part of the federal definition. Now, what I was surprised to learn, however, is that domestic terrorism is not a federal crime. International terrorism is a federal crime, but there is no crime for domestic terrorism. So the question I, I, I'd like you to talk about is, is it time to consider introducing legislation to make domestic terrorism a federal crime? Or, because there is an argument on the other side that says maybe it's best not to, since if it's a federal crime, a president could pardon anyone charged or convicted of domestic terrorism. Uh, and then finally, you know, do you think that there would even be Republican support for a law that made domestic terrorism a crime? I don't think there's any question that we have to explore uh, whether or not to make it a crime. I had uh, attempted in the last, last National Defense Authorization Act to make violent extremism a crime under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now, ironically, uh, that passed in the House and it was taken out in the Senate 
in part at the request of the Department of Defense. Hmm. So I, I do believe that it is, uh, it is a serious offense. It is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. And we have to be prepared to bring actions against those who engage in that conduct. Wow. So it, do, you, do you believe that, uh, or would you be someone who, be, who would be willing to put forward that kind of legislation? Uh, I certainly will explore um, that right, right. effort. Right. Um, impeachment, we know the resolution, it, it's officially on the table now. Things are moving. Uh, and I'm wondering um, if there should be consideration of the 14th Amendment. It's the Article 3 in the 14th Amendment, the third clause, to expel lawmakers who fermented the insurrection. I mean, I have a view that it's important to bring work for unity, but I think with unity comes accountability. And there are people, I believe, lawmakers who should be held accountable. So this idea has been floated by some uh, pro progressives in the Democratic Party in the House. Um, the section I'm talking about it basically says, this is in the 14th Amendment, no person shall be a senator or a representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, who shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion or given aid or comfort to the enemy. So the question is, um, is this something that should be talked about, uh, use, utilizing the 14th Amendment? Uh, Lawrence Tribe, who was an expert in constitutional law, has said, don't do it. He is absolutely warned against it. I'm not sure what his reasoning is, but I did see something this morning where he has weighed in and said that is not the direction that we should be going. Um, so do you have any, any thoughts about that? Well, I think expelling members uh, who are aiding and abetting uh, would be hard to uh, make the case for. Uh, censure may be a more appropriate uh, action to take. You know, unfortunately, what we're dealing with is uh, the cult of personality of Donald Trump and uh, the political and emotional control he has over not just the mob that we saw on Wednesday, but the members of Congress. Two thirds after that horrific act, we then came back to do our duty to um, ceremoniously accept the certificates um, of the election by the electors and to open them. That was our role under the Constitution. The Republicans in the House and again in the Senate. Uh, wanted to challenge that resolution and did so and outlined what they saw were all of these instances of fraud. And two thirds of them, including the minority leader, two thirds of them, and, and Kevin McCarthy included, voted to overturn the election in Arizona and in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, it, can you, can you censure two thirds of the members of the house? Um, I, don't, I don't believe you can. You certainly, I don't believe can expel them. Um, but I think what we're seeing around the country is quite fascinating. You've seen Twitter shut down Trump. You've seen um, the apps for parlor in Google and um, Apple shut down. And all of a sudden, that megaphone doesn't exist, which really speaks to how social media has been used by this far right uh, minority to, to really overtake this country in a way that uh, is, tr is truly profound. So um, I, I think that, um, watching all of that and then watching Goldman Sachs and some of the, the CEOs of these companies now contemplate not uh, providing campaign contributions to these very people uh, that would promote this falsehood. I mean, there 
is a big lie that has been promoted by this president for four years and actually been accepted and embraced by two thirds of the Republicans in the House. Yeah. You know, you raise an interesting issue about how to maybe stop this craziness. So, yes, Trump has been banned from Twitter. Uh, the Facebook ban is not permanent. I don't know why they haven't done that. Uh, but you raise the issue that there are now these corporate executives that in reaction, in response to all this, are going to the pocketbook, going to the wallet and saying, OK, we're just going to withhold money from the very people who have been pr pr promoting this. So maybe maybe that's the way that change happens, that we look at you know, economic sanctions. I I'm thinking analogously to South Africa, apartheid. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing worked. But then when sanctions were imposed and then when the U.S. came on board in other countries, we saw an end to apartheid. So I I'm thinking maybe maybe that's what has to happen somehow to get those who have heretofore been funneling money to people promoting the big lie to get them to stop doing it. What, what do you think? I mean, do you think this is something that it's going to spread throughout the country? I hope so, because, you know, it. it it does not appear that we can heal ourselves within Congress. Um, it's, a, it's a very sad thing to have to say, but uh, what, what prompted these members to say and do what they said was personal. It was their interest in wanting to retain their positions, to be able to garner support from Donald Trump in the future and to fundraise. They were using that opportunity mm -hmm. to go to their bases and go to the Trump base generally and say, see, I wanted to overthrow this fraudulent election. Um, so if you get to the base, the real base of what we're talking about, it's self-preservation in office. And that's why you had so many members take the positions that they did. You had, you know, great heroism by people like Adam Kinzinger, who said, you know, um, I'm not going to do this. And look at Liz Cheney. I, I must tell you, I went to her uh, and said, Liz, I, I'm really impressed by your courage here and by your willingness to speak out. Um, so I think there is some growing concern within the Republican caucus that the leadership with Steve Scalise and Kevin McCarthy um, did a, a great disservice to their brand and that they mishandled the uh, situation on the 6th. Oh. You know, we're getting some very good questions coming into the chat room from those who are viewing. And I just want you to know that before we started, we had more than 400 people um, mm -hmm. who are uh, participating, listening, and, and some are participating in the chat. Um, so w one question that has come through and it c picks up more on security. So let's talk about January 20th. I mean, do you think that, that the inauguration should happen in Washington or as some people are saying, it should be in an undisclosed location and maybe just live streamed? But what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Certainly, President-elect Biden has the ultimate decision to make. But if we do this in an undisclosed location, isn't the mob winning? Isn't it showing them that we're afraid of them? Um, we can't do that. So uh, what I believe will happen is that there's gonna be a hardening of the perimeter. We're going to be prepared that the National Guard will be deployed, all the elements necessary to protect the president-elect and the vice president-elect. Um, and, you know, the membership of Congress, as we witness, uh, what we intend to make sure is a peaceful transition of power. Do you, what are your thoughts about um, after Donald Trump is out of the White House of pursuing him for other, for his behavior, either federal or state and or state prosecutions? Uh, do you think that should happen or there are others who say, no, you know, maybe for the sake of unity, we should just kind of move forward. What are your thoughts on going after Mr. Trump once he is out of office? I think those decisions will be made by uh, state attorneys generals and uh, 
U.S. attorney generals. I certainly get the impression from President-elect Biden that he wants the country to heal. He, he wants to be able to move forward. We have such uh, horrific issues, separate and distinct from what just happened, with 375,000 now Americans dead from COVID, uh, that we, we've got to keep our eye on uh, what's the most important. So um, while some of that may take place, and nobody is, nobody is uh, above the law, and the president has for four years conducted himself as if he is because he's had the protection of an attorney general uh, opinion some decades ago that you cannot charge a seated president. Well, once he's a regular U.S. citizen again, I think he's going to be subject to the laws just like everyone else. Um, and I think that Michael Cohen, I remember sitting in that committee hearing when Michael Cohen testified, and I think Michael Cohen had it um, right. And if you go back and listen to any of his testimony, it's actually pretty prescient about how Donald Trump would not accept a peaceful transition um, of power, uh, that he had engaged in tax evasion, insurance fraud, bank fraud. I think all of those will come um, true, that we will find all of that. I mean, he is who he is, whether it's, you know, uh, being a, a charlatan and a, a, a barker for Trump University or his foundation, everything about him is fraudulent. And we've got to be willing to come forward and say it. We've got a, another question in from the, the chat room about, do you think uh, it has been suggested by Congressman uh, Clyburn that the impeachment could be delayed until after the first 100 days of President Biden's um, terms. So wh what do you think about delaying it as opposed to moving forward now? Well, I actually think it's an interesting idea. And I think it's our obligation to impeach. Um, we are taking that action. The Senate obligation is to try and convict if appropriate, and they can take that action when they deem it's appropriate. I think the transition of power, getting this new administration up is really critical. So making sure that he can move forward with his appointments uh, to the cabinet uh, is, is very important. And so I would um, certainly be willing uh, to see that step taken. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the Electoral College. Uh, the, they, you all met, uh, well, the Senate met on January 6th. Everyone met um, to conclude the presidential election. And just as a reminder to people that the Electoral College has 538 members, one for each U.S. Senator and Representative and three for the District of Columbia. And the Electoral College indirectly elects the President of the United States. And just as a bit of history, the college was a compromise between between those who wanted Congress to elect the president and those who wanted the popular vote to elect the president. But determining exactly how many electors to assign to each state produced a divide between slave owning and non-slave owning states. And the result was the controversial three-fifths compromise in that the enslaved would be counted as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of allocating representatives and electors and calculating federal taxes. So recently calls have been renewed to abolish the electoral college and to elect the president with a direct popular vote. Do you think this is a good idea or not uh, to get rid of the electoral college? And, and I'm wondering, is it even possible uh, to do so? What do you think? You know, as, as we were sitting there listening to the debate, uh, the Republicans were making the case to get rid of the Electoral College and move to a popular vote election. If you look at it historically, um, there is only one election in which the Republicans were successful in both the Electoral College and the popular vote in the last 30 years. Um, as populations move to each of the coasts um, and they get uh, focused there. It means that many of these smaller states have a, an un, um, they have a, um, a power that really 
violates this one person, one vote um, law that we've always embraced. So, um, but the, the problem is, of course, that these smaller states recognize this um, great power they have, and they're not about to relinquish it. No one wants to relinquish power. So they're unwilling. The only way you can really move forward, I think, with that is to provide, dangle some carrot in front of them. And I don't know what the carrot is. Um, It's always probably money. But uh, that would be the only way I think we're going to be successful in the near term. I think it's an idea that should stay alive and we should keep talking about it. Um, I, of course, I'm troubled more by the underpinnings of it, how it even came to be. Um, but I, I, I think it's something that I know a lot of people now are writing about it, talking about it more. But um, it's certainly, I think, a major issue as, as we go forward. Um, more than 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. And now the big lie told by Trump um, that the election was you know, a fraud uh, has led to this armed insurrection. The divisions in our country are as stark as they were during the Civil War, maybe even more so. And there's also this grand delusion that COVID-19 is a hoax. Uh, For example, it's estimated that maybe uh, only 5% of the mob wore masks um, on January 6th. Uh, There's also footage from the insurrection of a noose, uh, Confederate flags, and let's not forget some of those in the mob at the Capitol wearing anti-Semitic shirts with Camp Auschwitz and uh, one with 6MNE, 6 million Jews murdered, not enough. Uh, Trump's endless repetition of lies has not only made fiction plausible, but made criminal conduct the norm. So my question to you, uh, Congresswoman, is should the focus be on mending fences and trying to engage with Trump supporters? Or is this a divide too wide to bridge? Should we just focus on the Biden-Harris agenda, full speed ahead, and cross our fingers? Well, that's the ultimate question, isn't it, Latouris? Um, I, I would say this. Uh, if you look at who made up this mob, it was made up of anarchists, white supremacists and anti-Semitics. And they used Donald Trump to give their voice amplification. And he used them for his interest in wanting to retain power. So it is a toxic brew that um, really uh, needs to be diluted. Um, I, I think that we need to move forward with the Biden-Harris agenda. I also think that, you know, Democrats rightfully have been criticized for losing touch with working Americans. You know, there was a book written by, um, I think Tom, I think his name is Thomas Frank, about um, listen liberals. And in it, he talks about how during the Clinton administration, Um, the president then became very infatuated with Wall Street. And then in the Obama administration, um, he became very infatuated with the um, Ivy League schools. And meanwhile, you have, you know, many Americans feeling that um, the Democratic Party that they once were, you know, proud carrying members had, had left them. So, Uh, I do think we need to do some soul searching. I'm working with uh, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur about um, what we do with what we used to call the Rust Belt, which is offensive to people that live in the Midwest, um, that we should call it the Opportunity Belt. And we need to reconnect with them. And, um, you know, I've done some reading. There's a great book by Arlie Hochschild called Strangers in Their Own Land. She's a professor at UC Berkeley. And you know, she went after the Tea Party took hold and went and spent time in uh, the St. Charles Parish in Louisiana and, and spent, you know, Sunday dinners with them and went to church with them. And over a course of many months, um, tried to get a sense of what, what was um, moving them into this Tea Party group, which I think has now evolved into the 
the Trumps and this mob gathering. And she talked about line cutters. Now, most of these people just thought that everyone else cut in line so they couldn't get ahead. Um, so we gotta, we've got to do a better job of connecting with rural America and you know, working class Americans. So here's a question from uh, one of our uh, viewers here. Will increasing the study of history and civics in this country make a difference going forward? Boy, I, I think that is so important. Uh, I think that I've talked to many communities in, in San Mateo County on a call last week thinking, what we, we need to create Civics 101 on a community level and start having these conversations so people understand um, what this democracy is and how to protect it. We are very cavalier about our government, somehow that we think that it's just always going to be there. And uh, it is, as we know, historically, not the case that democracies fall, but they uh, crumble sometimes from their own um, actions. But uh, we have a responsibility, I think, to reinvigorate civics uh, as a community effort, not just in the schools, but for all of us as adults. You know, I have heard it said by some leaders, local, state, federal, that in the aftermath of the insurrection, I've heard this phrase, this is not who we are. This is not America. This is not who we are. And I really take issue with that because I think this is who we are. That when we say that, I think we're, we're, we're kind of saying, going back, to, hearkening to this message of we here, the U.S., we have this, this standard of excellence. We're just kind of above everybody and and so this is who we are versus this is not who we are. And I, I really looked at what happened on January the 6th and everything that has preceded it, uh, you know, going back to Memorial Day 2020, George Floyd, and way before that. I mean, I have parents who uh, came up in the Great Migration and lived under Jim Crow. So when I hear people say that this is not who we are, I'm thinking this is not who we want to be, ought to be. Um, but it is who we are. And so I'd love to hear your, your thinking about that. You know, I bristle um, when we talk about the exceptionalism in the United States. There's an arrogance to that that I find, you know, personally offensive. I mean, we are imperfect. It is um, an imperfect union, but one that we aspire to make more perfect. And we We've made many mistakes over the history of this country. Um, obviously, slavery being the most egregious, but um, you know, we can look even more recently to see how we, how do you cage babies on the border? How do you do that? Um, I made two trips to the border to try and you know, shine a bright light on that kind of conduct. Um, and I, we have so much repairing to do. Um, and when you look at how willing we were uh, to basically shut off any movement of refugees into this country, how do you have the statute of liberty? And then, you know, cut the number of refugees per year from 120,000 down to 18,000. That's what President Trump did. Um, so, um, I would agree with you, Ladora. It is, it is, um, it is who we are. Um, there's a horrible video of Lou Correa, who is a colleague from California, who was at the airport and was, you know, getting ready to get on a plane to come home right after um, the uh, events of January sixth, and listening to the voices of those men and women badgering him um, is worthy of all of us to view because um, it is who we are uh, and we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. I, I'm sometimes I'm try not to get down about all of this and, and uh, believe that there's, there's still hope. Um, I'm ever always ever hopeful, but when we talk about the work to do, I mean, there's so much of it. Um, so one of the things I try to do is just learn from everything that's happening here. 
Uh, so one of the things I've learned during the last four years is that um, there was this kind of an evil genius to the way in which uh, Trump operated for four years. Um, and the evil genius was kind of an orchestrated chaos right up mm -hmm. to this final week where so much was happening. It was almost impossible to stay aware of everything that he and his administration were doing. So let me give you the most recent example, which was this week. This past week, it was the administration's 11th hour bid to undo the civil rights protections for people of color, women, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ communities. So the Justice Department on January 5th submitted to the White House for its approval to narrowly enforce Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, where there's, so there's proof of intentional discrimination. So what, what it requires now for to get the protections, all you have to do is show a disparate impact from the policies that are being utilized or rules being utilized that, that have a disparate impact on these groups. So this letter that was submitted for approval by the White House was to get rid of that and say the only way that these rules can be enforced is if there's proof of intentional discrimination. That's on his desk right now. Uh, so I, so from all of this orchestrated chaos, I wonder, you know, who, who is keeping an eye on all of this? How is this going to work? I mean, so much stuff has been undone and done uh, during this administration. So what, what's your sense about how all of this stuff that has been orchestrated for three years is going to be addressed? Well, I can tell you from, from one perspective, um, as one of the co-chairs of the Democratic Women's Caucus, uh, this whole issue of uh, discrimination, whether it's through race or sex, is one that we're very concerned about. And we have uh, provided the new administration with a list of probably 60 executive orders that the president uh, can um, impose upon becoming uh, the president in that first 100 days. There is a lot that has to be undone that President Trump has done by executive order or, or regulations that have um, to be reworked. And I think the president's new cabinet is up to the task. So I'm optimistic that um, we have a good handle on what these actions are and how they have to be unraveled. So um, let's talk about the Thomases. So there's Clarence Thomas mm. and there's Jenny Thomas, his spouse. Uh, so recently uh, information has been disclosed that Jenny Thomas uh, was a strong supporter of, if not, if not actively involved in this insurrection, this whole mob gathering. Uh, and I saw one thing on social media, again, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, there was one uh, indication that she had actually financed and paid for some of the buses that brought some of these folks in to um, try to tear down the Capitol. So the question becomes, uh, if indeed all of this were true, I'll just give you a hypothetical, uh, I think most of it is, that she engaged in all this behavior. The question is, what does that mean with respect to Clarence Thomas's tenure on the Supreme Court? Uh, so there are some people who may say, well, what do you mean? There are two different things. That's she's doing that. He's on the court. But, you know, there are these rules about conflicts of interest that say, for example, um, if I were on the on the bench and uh, I had a close relative who um, was doing something that had something to do with uh, litigation coming into my court, I'd have to disclose that and then decide whether or not to recuse myself. Uh, so there are these kinds of things, conflicts of interest, the appearance of the conflict of interest or, or actual conflict. So you know, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, if she was, and she is, uh, we all know, uh, that's pretty clear that she's you know, on the extreme right. But if it's the case that she was actively involved in promoting all this, do you think this should have any repercussions regarding Clarice Thomas's tenure? Well, you know, that is something that is you know, subject to a factual um, review. Uh, if she was funding this, then 
it would appear that he is um, conflicted and would at the very least have to recuse himself on cases that dealt with any of the conduct by these individuals. Um, you know, he has been a, uh, a less than um, productive member of the, the Supreme Court. I certainly would like to see what his colleagues on the Supreme Court say and do about his conduct. And I, I wonder to what extent they have the ability to provide some kind of regulatory function over his um, conduct moving forward. And my fantasy, of course, is that he would have to step down and then Joe Biden could make his first appointment to the Supreme Court. But right. uh, that's my fantasy. Um, so if you were um, Joe Biden and you're getting ready to be sworn in, what's, what are among the first things you would do to ease the tensions in this country? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think that Joe Biden is more prepared to do that than I am, actually. Um, I think that uh, his 30 plus years in the Senate have given him um, you know, great experiential abilities. Um, by nature, he is a, a person that wants to get to yes. And we certainly should give him the opportunity to attempt it. I guess I've become more cynical in watching the Republicans generally to think that um, they're not interested in that. Certainly in the House, they can, they can taste uh, regaining the majority. And so much of what I think Kevin McCarthy was doing was this, with his pugnacious nature when he introduced the speaker on the day that we were sworn in was, you know, kind of messaging all of that to the base and to Donald Trump so that they could, you know, move forward with that. So in terms of healing our country. Um, I think we have to do a lot more listening. I mean, as much as I find everything that was done by that mob despicable, um, we, we've got to find out what, what, is, what is it that motivates them? And I, I don't, besides hatred and, and bigotry and um, anti-Semitism, I, what what is their core? Yeah. Well, one of the things that Bernie Sanders has said is that what we need to do is address their economic well-being of Americans. And that gets back to what you were saying about how you think that at some point Democrats lost touch kind of with those maybe in rural America, but those even um, who are just, you know, low income, who are, you know, just not getting, you know, really benefiting from what this country has to offer. And, and Bernie Sanders suggested that that really should be the focus. And once people start appreciating that it is Democrats that can make them feel better in terms of how they can live their lives, uh, both economically, you know, their social stability, that that may indeed be a factor in kind of shutting it, bringing us together. That being said, there are those people who are just haters, who just, you know, they have issues with, you know, the fact that I have melanin here and, and uh, that, you know, people are Jewish. There, there, are, there are those, and, and there, I can't spend any time on that. I don't have any desire to be in conversation with folks who think like that. Um, so did you happen to see the interview, 60-minute interview of uh, Speaker Pelosi last night? I did. Uh, all right. So I, I came away very disappointed uh, with uh, the way Leslie Stahl um, spoke to Speaker Pelosi. Um, I felt she was combative, she meaning Leslie Stahl. But in addition, uh, I was really concerned about questions that were asked. So one that came up. Now, remember, we've just come off of this insurrection. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's life was absolutely threatened. I mean, they were clearly making a beeline for her office and for her. And, you know, one of the questions she's asked uh, among them was, you know, what about your age? And, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you're of this age and you're not bringing up people who are, you know, younger people in your stead. And, and she took, Nancy Pelosi took issue with that. But, and, and there were others um, and other questions that were, a tr that she raised with, Nancy Pelosi that I felt were just entirely inappropriate and combative, especially in light of what just happened. 
I don't know what what was your your read on that, and also your take on Nancy Pelosi, just in general. Well, Nancy Pelosi will be eighty one in March, but there is no one in the caucus that can compare to her ability to bring us together, to stand firm, to uh, get to yes, to count votes. And, you know, there's a lot of competition that exists among people that get elected to public life, right? And there's lots of young people in Congress that are anxious to move up. And I certainly respect that, but you can't take anything away from Nancy Pelosi and how um, she has kept the caucus together and, and kept us moving <clears throat> forward. Now, for those that say, well, but you know, we look at all the months that passed before we got the COVID CARES Act too. Well, she was <clears throat> trying to protect state and local governments to protect teachers and law enforcement and um, police and fire in terms of making sure that there was gonna be money available to keep them employed. So, um, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, but I do think that you've, it's, it's, it's very easy to look at something like that and say, well, there should have been this effort undertaken. You can't lose sight of the fact that Mitch McConnell did to Nancy Pelosi what he did to Merrick Garland, uh, just frustrating any effort to move forward in a positive way. So, um, I think Leslie Stahl was being um, an aggressive reporter, um, but uh, I, I think that um, Nancy Pelosi, as our speaker, has shown us over that she's capable of um, pushing back, uh, as I think she did. So talk to me about uh, Stacey Abrams. Rock star. <laughs> Goddess. Uh, I mean... <clears throat> know what she wants to do uh, with her future, but um, she's an extraordinary talent. And um, she has, I think, in a, a very significant way, uh, given uh, um, us the opportunity to have the Senate work in conjunction with the House to move a policy agenda that's going to help America. So she's, um, she's truly amazing. Yeah, I, I'm Curious as to whether or not she will again uh, make a run for governor um, in Georgia, uh, but she's she's a force. She's absolutely mm -hmm. a force, and and I guess people really need to understand that she spent a decade, she spent ten years working to um, get voters, um, Democratic voters, together in Georgia and get them organized, and and she she absolutely pulled it off, uh, and not her alone, but she was really the moving force that that really did this. Well, um, she all these entities, you know, all these nonprofits to operate. So um, just a very strategic mind. So, you know, Georgia may be her, her first goal, but I hope it's not um, her last goal. And, you know, I, I'd like to just say, Ladoris, um, one of my colleagues in this, you know, group that we call the gallery group, <coughs> where we were um, stuck in the gallery together, was saying how... Um, it was, you know, how she can't blend in. Um, so the, the fear and anguish and um, sense of insecurity that someone who is not white has when you're dealing with these kinds of forces is really um, something that as a white woman, um, I, I want everyone in my world to know that um, we have got to um, recognize that it is a different world for people who are not white in this country. And that was very obvious during um, the insurrection and, and after. Yeah, I do worry. I worry about people like Stacey Abrams. I worry about Kamala Harris, the people who are of color who are in leadership and because of what I saw and what we all saw in the insurrection, I mean, people came with um, these ties so that there were thoughts about, you know, really tying people up, taking hostages, the weapons, and given how America, much of America looks at 
uh, guns and how the Supreme Court has interpreted the the Second Amendment. I mean, there there are so many concerns I have now, more so than before, about their safety, your safety, um, uh, of those who are, are speaking out. So we're moving into, unfortunately, a different time here, a different phase in American America. But um, I still believe that democracy is going to hold strong and that we're going to going to push through this. Um, not long ago, I was standing in line waiting to enter a store um, and everyone was socially distancing and they were wearing masks. And my mask had on it the words Black Lives Matter. Uh, so I was startled when this white man who was not wearing a mask walked up to me. He pointed his finger in my face and he yelled, get the F over it. And he yelled it again, get the F over it. And he was just angry and right in yelling at me. And so I stared at him. And after a few seconds, he just angrily just walked away. Um, not one person in that line, all of whom were white, spoke up. No one told that man that he was wrong. And nobody spoke up in my defense. The silence around me was deafening. I didn't know, and I still don't know to this day, if the silence of those around me demonstrated their indifference, their support of this man, or their fear. Uh, whatever the reason, the man who was outraged by my presence in a public space walked away, likely emboldened to insult others who look like me. So I'm, I'm curious about what do you say to those members of Congress uh, who've remained silent over the last four years? What do you say to those people who, who, who sit silently in response to the insurrection on January 6th? What will it take to break the silence of complicity? I think it's education. Um, just hearing your story, LaDoris, um, you know, sent shivers up and down my spine again. I mean, as, as white Americans, um, we, we are required to come to your defense, to protect you, to, um, to push back on that. Otherwise, this is not this democracy we say it is. It, it is not equal rights for all. Um, you know, this whole mask phenomenon is is also, um, I think, indicative of uh, this um, hate that that Donald Trump was was trying to impose. You know, after we were all gathered in this secure location, you know, there was over two hundred and fifty members in this you know fairly small space. Um, Many of my Republican colleagues were not wearing masks. One of our colleagues, Bonnie Watson Coleman, Bonnie Coleman Watson, um, has just had a bout with cancer. Um, she was sitting there. Uh, we got a notice this morning that she's tested positive for COVID. Now. Um, I'm in the process of drafting a letter. If Members of Congress are unwilling to wear masks to protect others from their potential risk of spreading this when 58% of those that spread it do not have any symptoms, then that's, you know, that is like an act of uh, committing a um, injury on someone else and or death. I, I get to a point where there, there are no words. There just are no words. Um, I'm going to see um, yeah, if we have any more questions. Um, here is one last question I'll take uh, from our grab. Do you see any, pos do you see any possible changes in gun laws following this insurrection? Well, I do believe now that we have the House and Senate and the presidency, that doing something as modest as making sure that everyone uh, has a background check before they can get a gun will probably pass very quickly. Um, but it really is only closing loopholes in what is the existing law, as we all know. It's just making sure that if you buy a gun online or if you um, buy a gun 
um, at a gun show that you're going to be required to have a background check. Now, we need to go further and make sure that the, the purchases of um, single individuals to other single in individuals is subject to this as well. And we'll see if we're going to be successful in getting it. But that will be the first step. It will be an important step. But, um, you know, getting an assault weapon ban passed again is something that I would certainly uh, appreciate us doing. So and we have it in California, but again, you know, the, the borders are porous. And so AK-47s can move around. I am one of the co-authors of legislation <coughs> to prevent members from bringing guns onto the floor. Believe it or not, um, there is a means by which um, a member of Congress can bring a gun into the Capitol, can't bring it onto the floor, but could bring it into the Capitol. And um, I think we've got to prevent that from happening. Wow. So Congresswoman Sphere, our time together has come to an end. And I, I can't thank you enough for your common sense, your smarts, your calm, and your your courage. So I, I, I want to close our time together with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who cared deeply about our country and about our democracy, and who understood the importance of people like you, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, who have the courage to speak truth to power. And he said this, he said, it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time. We must realize that the time is always ripe to do right. I thank you, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, for always making the time to do right. Our thanks to you. We also thank our viewing audience, uh, I am Ladaris Cordell, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. Be safe, everyone. Thank you, Ladaris. Thank you.